Thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting my channel. Get Nebula for free if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. When you think of drawing a scientist, what does that person look like? The Draw Scientist test started in 1966 when social scientist David Chambers asked almost 5,000 elementary school students to draw a picture of a scientist. Only 28 of those drawings were female scientists, and all of them were drawn by girls. This test has been replicated over the past five decades with over 20,000 students, and the good news is that the percentage of female scientists drawn has gone up from 0.6% to 28%. However, this increase still highlights a disparity in the perceptions of children as it relates to scientists, and it likely influences their perceptions of who can be a scientist. Now, the challenge of representation extends far past the draw scientist test to things like machine learning data sets, which often have representation issues due to historical biases against certain populations. The obvious solution would be to collect more data from these marginalized groups and make that data available to researchers to create more balanced data sets, as well as to the public to increase representation in things like stock photos. However, acquiring more data can be hard. Data can be expensive and difficult to acquire and process. In fact, anything involving medical data is a great example of this challenge. You can also unintentionally end up exploiting the groups that you're trying to collect data from. In fact, Clearview AI did this unintentionally or otherwise by scraping images of people from social media platforms to create their facial recognition data sets, thereby violating the terms of service for most of these platforms, as well as the individual privacies of the people that these photos came from. But what if you could just make more data to represent these groups instead of having to engage with them directly? Well, it turns out that we're not the first people to come up with this idea. Synthetic data, or data that has been generated by some sort of algorithm instead of coming from its traditional source, has been an increasingly popular area of research for academic researchers and industry alike. In fact, there are several startup companies that now offer to provide this AI-generated diversity. However, it also turns out that this idea isn't as ethically clear-cut as it might seem on the surface. Why? Well, we'll get into it in this video. Before we dive into the ethics, though, let's start from the beginning. Why do we want synthetic data in the first place? There's a lot of answers to this question, but the broad answer is that synthetic data allows us to expand our data sets without needing to go back to the original source of our data, which is particularly helpful if you can't go back to that source. It also usually requires less money and time. Generating synthetic data will cost you as much and take as much time as the computational resources that you have. It also allows you to create data sets for specific situations that you may not have real data for. For example, if you'd like to perform fraud detection and you want to make sure that your fraud detection algorithm can identify audio deepfakes, you can generate audio deepfakes from real voices and use that to train your algorithm for that specific use case. Speaking of security, synthetic data is also increasingly used for data privacy. To create synthetic data, we have to have some understanding of the distribution that we would like that data to represent. So by generating synthetic data with the same distribution as the private data that you would like to protect, you can share that synthetic data and the information that comes with it without compromising user privacy. In fact, this is essentially what differential privacy is, which we discussed in an earlier AI 101 video. An example of synthetic data that you're likely more familiar with is the AI-generated faces of people who don't exist. In a past video, we discussed how these images have been used for anything from fraud to espionage, but more recently, companies have begun to sell AI-generated stock photos and fashion model images to companies who are looking to create more diverse content, whether it be for the company brochure or for a corporate training video. These images are typically generated using generative adversarial networks, which I discuss in more detail in my last deepfakes video, by collecting images of real people and training a model to create new images that are virtually indistinguishable, at least to the model, from the real faces. For some of these companies, you can even include the characteristics that you'd like in your stock photos, whether it be race, gender, or a certain fashion sense. On the surface, this might seem like a simple way to increase the diversity that we see in stock images around the world. Children might see more female scientists and draw more female scientists and then maybe become female scientists. Businesses might be able to appeal to a wider audience, or prospective employees might feel more comfortable joining a new company. But just because it's easy doesn't mean we should be using it. For one, these images aren't perfect. Samantha Cole, a journalist who writes for Vice, highlighted this in an article from last year where she dug through the generated photos dataset of over 100,000 AI-generated free-to-use faces and found some... 
interesting ones. Second, just because these faces are generated by an algorithm doesn't mean that people aren't still being exploited. The datasets used to generate these images are filled with the faces of real people who likely don't know that their faces are in these datasets in the first place, didn't give permission for their faces to be used in any of these datasets, and almost definitely won't be compensated for any associated sales. Third, these data collections can be used to make fake profiles for fraudulent or otherwise malicious purposes. Now, you could also just as easily do that using the face of a random stranger, but these images are arguably harder to track because there's no label or watermark associated with them to let you know that it's an AI-generated image. At least with a random stranger, you can perform a reverse image search. And finally, services like this undercut the fact that there are stock photo companies selling diverse collections of stock photos that were created with the permission of the people in the photos. In fact, many of those people were also compensated for the photos. In other words, you don't have to use an AI-generated image. You can just pay a real person to use a real picture of their face for your corporate brochure or company training video. Now, personally, I instinctively shy away from the use of machine learning algorithms to increase diversity or representation. As we discussed in my video on AI fairness, datasets aren't the only part of the machine learning pipeline where bias can be introduced. In fact, the models themselves can amplify biases that you might not see in your datasets, and developers often unconsciously integrate bias by asking questions questions that are formed by their own experiences. Additionally, inherent in diversity is heterogeneity, that is, things don't look alike. And inherent in machine learning predictions and generations is a learned or known distribution of your data set. In other words, even if the images that you're using to train your machine learning models seem diverse, you're always limited by the distribution of the data that you're using. And limiting your definition of diversity to that distribution may create a false sense of security when you're actually increasing the homogeneity of the world around you. Having said that, there's a lot of interesting work to be done in increasing the diversity of data sets for applications other than making sure your company has a socially acceptable number of people of color on your website. For example, medical imaging data sets for different conditions can be pretty unbalanced, which makes developing diagnostics tools harder. As I've mentioned in probably too many videos, I actually created and used synthetic data when I was working on an MRI reconstruction machine learning project as a summer student at Stanford. In fact, I would love to do a deeper dive into the papers on this topic, as well as into papers on other topics that I cover on this channel. But those videos can be hard to make because they're relatively niche and a lot of the people who come across my channel probably wouldn't be interested in it. That's why me and my creator friends teamed up to build Nebula, a platform where you get to watch my videos ad-free and we can create and experiment with awesome content without having to worry about demonetization or paying tribute to the YouTube algorithm. We're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction videos. Want to learn more about diverse figures in computing? Check out Calculating Ada, the Countess of Computing, a documentary about Ada Lovelace, one of the first computer programmers. While CuriosityStream is all about big budget nonfiction documentaries, we're creating Nebula so that education -y creators can have a space to try out content ideas that might not work on YouTube. You'll find some of your favorite creators on Nebula, from Braincraft to Up and Atom to Metal at Crisis, as well as my monthly Nebula Journal Club, where I'll be taking that deeper dive into papers that relate to one of the videos that I do each month. Journal Clubs will be coming out on the last Monday of every month, starting with this coming Monday, where we'll be talking about a paper on DNA digital data storage, where people are building physical objects comprised of synthetic DNA, and seeing how much information you can extract from those objects when you take a bite out of them. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so if you click on the link in the description or use my promo code JORDAN, you can access CuriosityStream for 26% off their annual plans, with Nebula included for free as long long as you are a CuriosityStream member. That's less than $15 a year. Clicking on that link really helps out my channel, so if you would like to support my channel and get access to my videos ad-free and the monthly Nebula Journal Clubs, sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula using the promo code JORDAN or at curiositystream.com slash JORDAN. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also check out my last video on deepfakes where I get into the details of how generative adversarial networks work. Otherwise, you can follow my PhD life on Twitter and Instagram, and I'll see you all next Friday. Bye.